you know, it's such a joy to sing songs of the glories of the gospel with you. Um, appreciate so much your participation in that. We appreciate so much the people that lead us in that. Um, it's a tremendous encouragement, uh, and I hope and trust that you are built up by the words that we sing. Um, those last two songs, I have a feeling we may sing those again over the next few weeks. It's pretty fitting. Bridget read uh, a verse from our passage this morning. Um, Israel is set free. They begin their exodus out of Egypt in the passage we're going to cover this morning. Um, but we probably have a few weeks to get them you know, through the, the sea and then the, the song of praise on the other side. And uh, it just feels like we could sing No Longer Slaves every week between now and that point. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Exodus chapter 12. We're going to start reading in verse 29. It says, At midnight the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go. Serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said and be gone and bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel also had done as Moses had told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing, and the Lord had given people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds, and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt. For it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the host of Israel went out from the land of Egypt. It was at night. It was a night of watching by the Lord, to bring them out of the land of Egypt, so that this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house. You shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. All the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. There's a key phrase in this passage that I want us to key in on that I think helps us to understand or unlock the meaning of this passage. I think it comes in verse 42 where it says, It was a night of watching by the Lord. That word watching can mean guarding, keeping, like a, like a night watchman. 
Yahweh stands over His people to guard them, to keep them, to deliver them. And I think there are three ways, well, let's say there are two ways that I think this passage directs our attention and helps us to understand what the Lord does in His watching. And, and then the third point is kind of our response to the Lord's watching. The two points are this. Yahweh watches over the judgment of His enemies. The second point is Yahweh watches over the deliverance of His people. Point number one, the Lord was watching over the judgment of His enemies. You know, this whole first third of the book of Exodus is kind of cast as a conflict between Yahweh and Pharaoh, the serpent king. It's interesting, and I think we mentioned the fact early on that Pharaoh isn't named, and there's, there's probably at least two reasons for that. One is the Lord is is kind of showing us his insignificance. He, he's dishonoring Pharaoh by not naming him, while other less significant individuals like the, the, uh, the, the what you call it, the maids. What am I thinking? I've lost the word. Midwives. midwives. That's the word I'm looking for. The midwives do get named. But Pharaoh does not. But there's a second reason I think that it's significant that Pharaoh doesn't get named. See, we, we kind of get lost in the story a little bit, and we tend to forget that we are on Pharaoh number two at this point. Right? Because there was the Pharaoh that, that initially sent out the edict that all of the baby uh, born male children in, who were Hebrews were to be thrown into the Nile. Right? Like, we're just going to eliminate this problem. So Moses flees, and that Pharaoh dies while Moses is in the desert of Midian. So we are now on the second Pharaoh. Neither Pharaoh is named. And what happens in our mind is that the two of them kind of blend together. They kind of become one overarching figure in our mind. This larger than life person. And I think this is an intentional yet subtle way for the Lord to pull back the curtain of reality so that we can see that this is about more than a struggle for a, a race to survive. This is a spiritual battle that will become a paradigm for God's people. Showing us what kind of God He is. Showing us the answer to the promises of Genesis 3.15. That there will come a seed from this woman who will crush the serpent. It is in the context of Exodus something of an answer to Moses' question in chapter 4. Who are you? And helping us to answer or understand what the Lord means when He responds by saying, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. In other words, watch and learn. See who I am by what I do. He is the God of of Exodus, the God who recalls his people from exile, who saves from slavery and adopts into sonship. He is the kind of God who stands watch over his people. And part of that watch is to bring his enemies to their knees. The first four verses of this passage, I mean, it's just like there is an unquestioned victor to this conflict. It is a total victory by the Lord. The plagues have made it increasingly clear that Pharaoh was no match for God's strength and his power. 
And now with the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh has finally been utterly defeated. This defeat is stunning in how specific it is. Nothing that the Lord threatened against Pharaoh did not happen. We can go back to chapter 11. Moses warns Pharaoh. He says, Thus says the Lord about midnight, I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill and all the firstborn of the cattle, there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt. And that is almost word for word repeated in verses 29 and following through 33 in our text this morning. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn, the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn of the captive to the firstborn of the livestock. And there was a great cry in all, the, in all of Egypt. And we marvel at people who, who were able to call their shots, right? I was thinking of Joe Namath, the greatest shot caller, right? Like, we're going to win the Super Bowl. No one thought they were going to win. He goes out and he does it. Joe Namath is immortalized. He was, by all accounts, a subpar quarterback. It's irrelevant to the point, but stick it to the Jets whenever we can since they beat my Steelers last week. How about Larry Bird? I love this story. I heard this story about Larry Bird the other day when he was in the finals playing, uh, or, uh, or, or the, uh, the Eastern Conference Finals, I think, playing Detroit. No, I think it was the finals. I think they were playing the Lakers. And the, Lakers were, uh, the, the Celtics were down by a, a point or two. Celtics call timeout. Time's running out. Larry Bird, as he's walking by his defender, looks at the defender and says, all right, man, this is what I'm going to do. They're going to inbound me the ball. I'm going to dribble down to this corner, and I'm going to shoot a three, and I'm going to make it, and there ain't nothing you can do to stop me. And the guy was like, what? Who does that? Who tells their defender exactly what they're going to do? Like, that's crazy. And you know what he did? Exactly what he said he was going to do. And he was right. There was nothing his defender could do about it. We marvel at people like that. Man, here the Lord has called his shot against Egypt. He told Pharaoh exactly what would happen and he did not fail in one detail. In spite of Pharaoh's determination, all of his hatred toward Israel, all of his fear and manipulation, he could not stop the Lord from doing exactly what he said he would do. It was a total victory by Yahweh. There's a point I don't want us to miss here, though. It says it was from, you know, the firstborn died from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne of the firstborn of the captive to the firstborn of the livestock. In other words, from the palace to the pasture, right? There were no exceptions to God's judgment. No household would be left out. Why? Because God is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter how much money you might have had. It doesn't matter how charmed your life may have been. Nor did it matter how little money you had or how difficult life had been for you. It simply did not matter. Judgment was coming from the Lord and God is no respecter of persons. Every man is guilty before God and judgment is therefore inescapable. I think we're all tempted to think in one of these two ways, right? Like either life has been pretty good, my bank, is pretty, my bank account's pretty good, I'm healthy, my family is together, we're all doing fine, God must be good with me. Or on the other end of the spectrum, man, life has been one struggle after another and I, I never seem to have enough in my bank account and, and certainly God sees all that I've been through and He's going to give me a break. Certainly God will have pity. But neither works. It doesn't matter who you are or where you live or what you drive or even how hard your life has been. The reality is none of us are good enough to escape God's judgment against our sin. He watches over the judgment of His enemies. He ensures it will happen exactly as He has declared it. Now, we've spent time in this 
in this study of Exodus, considering the fact that there are no exceptions to this, and the reason that there are no exceptions is not because God is some meanie sitting up in the sky looking for people to pick on. No, it is because we are all guilty. We have all rebelled against his rule. We have all participated in our own form of hatred against this creator, savior God. There's good news attached to that judgment. We'll get to that shortly. But as God sits over and watches over the judgment of his enemies, not only is it a total victory, but it's also a humiliating defeat. The, the, the full completeness of the Lord's victory is demonstrated as soon as words start coming out of Pharaoh's mouth. First, he calls for Moses and Aaron in the dead of night, and that's humiliating. You know why? Because back in Exodus chapter 10, verse 28, what were Pharaoh's last words to Moses? Get away from me. Take care that I never see your face again or you never see my face again. For on the day you see my face, you shall die. I never want to see you again. And now here is Pharaoh in the dead of night going, uh, Moses and Aaron, can you come on over? Pharaoh couldn't kill Moses. He couldn't stop Moses. He couldn't even not see Moses. It's humbling. It's humiliating. And then when Moses and Aaron show up, he just concedes to everything that they had been asking. And you remember all along or at various times through this process, uh, he tried to compromise with Moses, right? Remember first it was, uh, you can go, but don't go very far, right? Just stay in Egypt. Then he's like, well, you can go, but just the men go. You don't need the children, the women, the livestock. Then he's like, you can go, but leave the cattle, right? You don't need to take those with you. Always trying to compromise. But now, after this tenth and final plague, he's like, up, go, get out. Both you, the people, go serve the Lord. Take your flocks and herds. I concede everything. It is a total victory by the Lord. It is humiliation for Pharaoh. God had raised up Pharaoh. Remember, he said he was going to do it. I'm going to raise up Pharaoh so that I can show my power through him. This elevation of Pharaoh is exactly what Pharaoh wanted. He wanted to be exalted. But the Lord raised him up in order to show his power, to humble Pharaoh, so that the superiority and the power of Yahweh might be displayed to all the earth. Pharaoh is lost. There's something of a, of a truth here that I think we can, we can take into account. It's going to become clear that not all of Egypt is siding with Pharaoh. Pharaoh gets a, a special level of humbling and humiliation here, in part because Pharaoh had a special level of hardening all the way through. The higher Pharaoh seemed to exalt himself, the harder he hardened his own heart the greater the humiliation was to become. The greater the fall. Now Pharaoh at this point could have responded, I believe, with repentance. And he could have confessed his sin to the Lord like, man, I am broken. Could have turned to Yahweh for pardon. But in verse number 32 he says this, Get out, take your cattle, and bless me also. Right? What's that about? Right? Like, did Pharaoh repent? Is he going to serve the Lord now? Like, he's looking for blessing from God. Right? Isn't that, isn't that what we all should do? What's he doing here? He kind of sounds a little bit like Esau, doesn't he? Remember after Jacob comes in and pulls the whole deception and he gets the birthright uh, blessing from his father and then Esau comes in and realizes, you know, it, it dawns on everyone what's happened and, and Esau's like, bless me also, father. And his father's like, I got, like, like the blessing is gone. I can't. And he's like, there's got to be something. Bless me also. Esau wasn't repentant. He had lost. 
And he desperately wanted to get something from his father. He wanted some indication from his father that he was okay and was going to be okay. But when he realized that Jacob's deception couldn't be undone, his response was not humility and repentance. His response was, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to find him and I'm going to kill him. Listen, let's not be confused about that. That's not repentance language, okay? That's not humility, that's vengeance. That's not trusting in the Lord, that's taking matters into your own hands. That's not repaying evil with good and allowing the Lord to settle your case. That is usurping God's role as judge, jury, and executioner. And it wasn't repentance and faith for Pharaoh either. He's simply asking for Moses to make things okay. I heard one pastor this week say it's easier to ask for blessing than to ask for forgiveness. And that's the reality. And we've seen this with Pharaoh before. Right? Like he comes to, to Moses at one point and he's like, hey, uh, Moses, uh, you, you can go just, just get these flies out of here. Just pray for me. Pray for me. Bless me. Right? But don't forgive me. That's the part that's missing out of this equation. There is no humble repentance of sin. He still doesn't understand who the Lord is. He still sees Yahweh as a more powerful version of Ra. A God invented by man for the sole purpose of blessing man. That's what our gods are. We build them up in order to receive blessing out of them. He does not see himself as someone in need of a substitute to atone for his sins. He simply wants to know that he's okay and he wants confirmation from Moses. He wants a blessing, but not at the cost of repentance. Folks, isn't this how so many people treat the Lord today? We want the blessing. We want God to confirm that everything is okay with me. But to ask me to humbly repent of my sin feels a step too far. There is something about repentance that is repulsive to our fallen nature. I don't need it. I don't want it. I don't want to admit to it. But we want to know that we're okay. Particularly when things go bad. This is when people come and like, man, you're a Christian, pray for me. Right? Pray that this all works out. Pray that it all gets better. And listen, I'm more than happy to pray for you. But at some point, man, man God is desiring to hear from you. There must be a humbling in your heart. I used to hear all the time, you're, you're, you're a chaplain, you're a pastor, you got to have some connection with God. Pray for me, right? And most of the time I was like, pray that I get out of this place. Pray that my court case gets dropped, right? You, you can persuade the Lord, right? He kind of likes you, apparently. And my response was, look, I'm, I'm more than happy to pray for you, but why don't you humble yourself and go to the Lord in repentance and seek Him? See, the problem we get ourselves into is we tend to seek the things we get from God more than we seek God Himself. Right? Like, we want the blessing, but we don't want the relationship. I want the benefits, but I don't want the commitment. I want the stuff, but I don't want the humbling. Pharaoh wanted the blessing... But he didn't want repentance. And so God's judgment is justified. And it is borne out through Pharaoh's own decision making. God watches over the judgment of his enemies. But he also watches over the deliverance of his people. There's a, a bit of a debate before we get into some of the details here. There's a bit of, the, of a debate over verse number 37. 
the people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth. We're, we're not, there's some debate over where that is. This is about 600,000 men on foot. Now, that's a, that's a lot of people. This would, this would be 600,000 men of military fighting age. And, and it's caused a lot of debate around, you know, is that a legitimate number? That, that would mean about 2 million Israelites left Israel. Um, there's a, there is another, I think, legitimate possibility here. The, the word for thousand is a strange word in Hebrew. Um, the word for thousand, it, it's got a really wide semantic range. It can mean everything from cattle to clan or division to thousand. It, it seems to have kind of developed these meanings over time. And, and maybe we see the connection, right? Because when you see cattle, that's always a, a group, right? Like, like a large herd. And, and so, you know, you see a group of people over here, and we're like, wow, look at that. They're like cattle. And so the, the term just kind of develops over, over time, and eventually it, it's used to specify a thousand. But it seems there was a time when it was used to specify something like a, a small military group, uh, like in our military terminology, like a battalion. And most people would uh, assume that this battalion, or, or they believe this battalion would probably host somewhere between 12 and 15 men of fighting age. Now add to this, you know, the, the phrase on foot... Everywhere else in the Old Testament where this word on foot is used, it's used in reference to foot soldiers, except one place, right? So there seems to be this military terminology going on. Later it says all the hosts of the Lord are departing. Host is a term for armies. Um, so, so there's this possibility that, that it could be uh, talking not about 600,000, but about 600 battalions. So, so here's, here's the difference. We got on one hand the possibility of about Two million plus people leaving Egypt. On the other hand, probably somewhere between 35 and 40,000. Still a considerable number of people, right? That's still more people than would fit in Amelie Arena. All right? I think we could fit them all if we went down to Tropicana Field and removed all the tarps from the upper deck. That's a little over 40,000 people. That probably would have fit them. Okay, so we're still talking about a very large number of people either way. I don't think either way what we're... You're not doing injustice either way here, okay? I'll leave you to decide which way. And I'll be honest with you, if, if you go the division route, um, like it just starts unfolding a lot of things. Like there's a lot of numbers that need to be crunched through the rest of the Old Testament. And I did not have time to do that this week. So I didn't chase down every possibility here to even come to a firm conclusion to encourage you one way or the other. But the reality is the exact number doesn't really matter. What's important is that the Lord stood guard as every single one of them were expelled from Egypt. And I use that word expelled on purpose. Because verse 33 says the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. Verse 39 says, and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt. They couldn't even wait on the dough to rise. They were pushed out. The Lord didn't just open the door for them. and was like, hey, here's the open door whenever you're ready. The, the people were like, get out and get out now, right? You don't have time to pack. You don't have time to get food, supplies, nothing. Get out. Now, why would the Lord do it this way? Why not give them time? Why not be like, hey, you know what? Um, the door is open. Take a few days. Talk it over. Get yourselves organized. Get your supplies together. No, it's like, hey, Passover's happening tonight. You don't have time to let your bread raise. And the reason is because Israel or Egypt's going to throw you out. Why? I think it's because God is watching over his people. And when God watches over his people, when God stands guard over his people, one of the things he is watching is our own heart. He is standing guard, watching over the hearts of his people. And I think he knew Israel all too well. Man, if you would open the door. Listen, again, I had a lot of interaction with people who have been, have been incarcerated for periods of time. And I remember having a conversation with one guy who said, man, people just don't get it. Like I've been locked up and, and, and once you're in for a long time and people are telling you where to go and when to go there and when you can eat and what you can eat and what line you can cross and, and when you can cross it and when you can't and when you can go through an open door and when you can't. He said, then all of a sudden they open a door and they just throw you out. He said, it's terrifying and it's no wonder so many people are institutionalized and they just want to come back. 
He's like, you don't know how difficult it is to go from being on the inside to having the freedom of being on the outside again. It's terrifying. You lose the ability to know how to even make decisions for yourself. So let's, let's put that in, in, in Israel's context. You've been in slavery for 400 years. And I know it says 430 in this passage. It's not a contradiction. There's a number of possibilities as to why it's 430 here. It could just be a rounding issue. When God said, hey, they're going to be in, in, in Egypt for 400 years, it, he could have just been rounding it off. He could have been, by the way. He told uh, Abraham it's going to be 400 years or four generations. Generations is a very loose term, right? Um, it, Abraham lived to 120 years. Four generations of Abraham's age is 480, right? It's well over 400. So if we take that as kind of the, the general number and 400 just kind of as a, a round number, then when God shows up at 430, he's early, right? Or it could also be that there was a time when Joseph was in Egypt and things went well, right? So, so um, I, I believe it's Stephen in Acts chapter 7. He's like, they were afflicted in Egypt for 400 years. So maybe there was 30 years during the period of Joseph when things were going well, they were being blessed by Pharaoh. But then there arise, uh, you know, Pharaohs that didn't have respect for Joseph. And, 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 you know, the people of Israel start to lose their favored position in the land. And it kind of descends ultimately into the slavery and abuse. Don't really know. All those possibilities are, I think, uh, valid. But they've been slaves for over 400 years. I think it would have been unkind for God to just open the door and go, whenever you're ready. Because you know what? They'd have never been ready. I mean, they're going to get out. We mentioned this last week, I think. They're going to get out into the desert and go, we should go back. This is too hard. It's too hot. Too much sand. Not enough food. Not enough water. If you would have given them time to think about it, they're like, you know what? We do have an awful lot of, you know, I mean, our army is a pretty decent size. Now that God has decimated Egypt, maybe we could just stay here and kind of take over. I mean, the Hyksos did it a few hundred years ago. Why not us? They may have never left. You remember, part of God's thing here is not just to set them free. Part of God's, part of God's thing is to get Egypt out of Israel. And, 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 and man, we're just incapable of doing that for ourselves. God moves in to do what Israel would not have had the ability or maybe the, the fortitude to do for themselves. You can probably think of a time when maybe you just weren't sure what the Lord wanted you to do next. You ever been in those situations? Man, should I quit this job? Should I break up with this person? Should I have this hard conversation? And while you're hesitating... It's like he comes along and just pushes you through the door, right? You're not sure whether you should quit this job or not? You're fired, right? You're welcome. You're not sure whether you should break up with this person or not? And then you get a phone call from the girlfriend the next day. Hey, we need to have a, can we, can we talk? And you laugh because you know it's true. We've all been there. But what is this? Is this God being like, hey, hurry up, right? Is God impatient with us? No, this is God's mercy to step in and do for us what we are paralyzed to do for ourselves, right? Some of us struggle with this paralysis of analysis idea, don't we? You know what I'm talking about? Like, you got these options, and I don't know, I don't want to make the wrong choice, and what if I buy the wrong thing? And it is sweet mercy when someone or something comes along and narrows down our choices for us. Maybe it's a sin issue for you. Maybe you know you shouldn't have kept doing it, but you don't stop, you keep coming back to it, and then one day you're discovered. It's like you can't stop yourself. I'm going to help you. And someone comes along and finds out, and it's an awful feeling to get caught, but it is God's mercy to force the issue on us when it is in our best interest. God is watching over the hearts of his people but he's also watching over the needs of his people. Verse 36 says that they plundered Egypt. How? By asking for stuff. And the Egyptians, man, they just got to the point where like, what do you want, right? Like anything you want to just get out. Right, like here's all my money, here's all my jewelry, here's the keys to my car. 
right? Whatever you want, just go. They barely had time. They just gathered up their kneading bowls and took it with them. Like you're not even going to have time to bake regular bread. Some of these thick, dry crackers. That's what you're going to eat. But God had already planned. The Lord had stood watch, ensuring that not only his people would go free, but that they would be well supplied for the journey, paid as it were for their years of service in Egypt. I've already got it figured out. And isn't that the hesitation for us so often? Like, oh, I would, but I don't know if it's going to work. Right? I'm there, you know, God is, is like, it's, but I don't know. And so often our hesitation is, is man, how, like, the, like the details, how's God going to fund, like, how am I going to pay the bills? What about this potential issue and that potential issue? Listen, I'm not saying, I, I want to be careful here, I'm not saying that we need to just jump both feet into a really bad decision. Right? I'm not saying we need to go out and, you know, get ourselves into a financial bind because we got faith that the Lord is going to take care of it. That can, that can be irresponsible. Right? But sometimes we compulsively and excessively worry over our needs rather than trust the Lord. God is watching out, watching over their hearts. He's watching over their needs. And he's watching over others who would come. Those that left, it says there's a mixed multitude. These are non-Israelites in all likelihood that decide we're going to go with Israel. We, we want to be with them. We want to identify with their God. And we're not sure they're, they're fully converted. I mean, God is going to come back and say, listen, you cannot participate in the Passover unless you're circumcised. You have to be in, right? But there's this mixed multitude that goes out with Egypt, kind of the precursor to Ruth. Remember, Ruth is like, where you go, I'll go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Here are these people looking around at the plagues going, this God is different, man, and we need to be with him. We want to serve this God. It's a good reminder that Exodus is an evangelistic book, that God is an evangelistic God. That he desires to spread his fame through all the earth. And it makes us, I like, we, we just end up asking the question of ourselves, right? if that's who God is, then what are we like? Are we evangelistic in our hearts? Are we looking for others who would be willing to repent, to show others the glory of God so that they might be compelled by His goodness and by His power to come serve Him also? Look, Psalm 121 says, the Lord is your keeper. He's your watcher. He's your guard. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you going out. You're going out and you're coming in from this, day time, from this time forth and forevermore. The Lord watches over his people. He is busy guarding your heart. He is busy caring for your needs. And he's watching for others who might be willing or interested to come. And all of this brings us to our response. That the Lord is worthy of looking at. He's worthy of watching for. He's worthy of waiting on. He is worthy of honor and worship. That's what it says back in verse number 42. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord. This is a magnificent God who watches over the judgment of His enemies, who watches over the deliverance of His people, 
Is he not worthy of being waited on? Waiting is not an easy thing. I'm sure Israel, after 400 years, was tired of waiting. I'm sure after nine plagues, they were tired of waiting. And God's like, hey, make this sacrifice and wait. You're not going to pick up a sword. You're not going to go out and fight. You're just going to wait. It's a lesson they don't learn very well, by the way, because they're not going to get to the sea, and what are they going to do? They're going to panic. And God's going to be like, would you wait? <laughs> would you just be still? It's a night of watching kept to the Lord. I was referring to the Passover specifically, right? Like that's what they were doing in their waiting, in their watching, they're honoring the Lord. They're commemorating. They're appreciating what the Lord has done. This is why we keep the Lord's Supper. We are commemorating and appreciating what the Lord has done for us, watching over our deliverance from sin. Through our Passover lamb, Christ. This way of worshiping the Lord is limited to those who have experienced His salvation and belong to Him. Those who are in. This is why we, we give the warning that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 11 when we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Do not participate unworthily. Right? This, is for, this is for people who are on the inside. There's judgment for those who participate in an unworthy manner. The final portion of our passage deals with the question of who then? Who is on the inside? Who may participate in Passover? And the answer is simple, but not comfortable. Okay, At least not for the men. Because the answer is anybody, but you have to be circumcised. Now, why circumcision? What's the linkage here? There's, there's an ancient Jewish interpretation of the Torah called the two bloods. I think that helps us here. There's, like we can't pull this directly out of Scripture. It's not there. But, but the interpretation is that during the Passover, because there were circumcisions being taken place, the blood from the circumcision was mixed with the blood of the lamb and applied to the doorpost. In other words, they saw circumcision as symbolizing a death. So I've got the lamb that is dying in my place as my substitute, but I also must die to the world. I must also die to these other gods and authorities that are over me. And, and I'm going to try not to be crass here, but what better way for men to come to a realization? Like, like what better piece of flesh? The thing that tends to be the ruler of the man's way of life prior to Christ. God comes right at that thing and says, die. Die to the world. Die to every other God. And so to be circumcised is to say, I'm no longer defined or controlled by my flesh. In this way, then, circumcision was a sign that you were part of a congregation. It was a death that brought renewal. You, you died to the world, and now you were alive to God. You were part of His people. You are part of His body. You have a new identity. You belong to Him. So the only ones then who could rightly celebrate Passover were those who had been circumcised, those who had taken this new identity as followers of the Lord, the one they had trusted to save them. Now, uh, we don't require circumcision to be a part of Holiday Bible Church. Whew, right? <laughs> Just, why not? Why not? Well, the Torah itself gives us a clue. Moses gives us a clue in Deuteronomy chapter 10. He says in verse 16, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart. And be no longer stubborn. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. In other words, Moses points to a deeper problem than a flap of skin. The problem is that no matter how much skin we remove, it doesn't take away our sin or our propensity to sin. Remember Jesus says, if your right eye offends you, do what? Plug it out. Why? Two reasons. He wants us to realize how 
bad sin really is and the lengths we should go to to keep ourselves from sinning. But number two, I think baked into the illustration is a realization that even if I pluck my eye out, my mind is perfectly capable of producing images that are against his glory. And even if I cut off my right arm, I have a left arm that is still perfectly capable of committing evil. And even if I cut off both arms, there is still evil desires in my heart. Moses' point is that the root of our problem is in our heart. Not the muscle that's busy right now pumping blood through your body, but the part of you that creates your desires, that ignites your passions, that hardens your will, that in many ways makes you, you. That thing needs a death and a renewal. It needs a cutting away of defilement. And the entire Bible is orienting us towards the solution to this problem. It is fixing our eyes on the one solution. Exodus is preparing us to see it, to recognize it so we don't miss it. And so we get this in Colossians chapter 2 and we're done. Paul writes, in him, in Jesus Christ, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. In other words, not a physical cutting of the flesh, but you're putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. Folks, this passage is dripping with Exodus imagery from circumcision to baptism, which is going to correlate to Israel passing through the sea to God canceling our debt and legal demands of death through a substitutionary sacrifice, even to the putting of rulers to open shame by triumphing over them, just like he did with Pharaoh. Paul is mining the imagery of Exodus to help us understand that our death and renewal does not happen by a cutting away of physical flesh. It comes through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our purification. He is our identity. Which means, men, our identity is not in our careers or our muscles or our ability to perform or in our influence over people. Your identity is in the God who won your freedom from your need to dominate. And ladies, your identity is not in your career or in your beauty, or in your ability to keep a perfect house, or even in your ability to be the perfect mother or wife. Your identity is in the God who watches over you, who will be your protector, even from the evil that still threatens to undo you from within. Teenagers, your identity is not in your ability to get a girl or a guy to like you. Your identity is not in your gender or your sexuality or your feelings or even in your friends. Your identity comes from the one who is worthy of receiving your worship. Kids. Man, think about God. I know you're not thinking about identity right now. Think about God. Listen to your Sunday school teachers and your parents when they tell you about him. Pray to him the best way that you know how. Think about him. Maybe for those who are not Christians this morning, man, can I just say, you don't have to be defined by your past. Either the wrong that you have done or the wrong that has been done to you. You do not have to be defined by the whims of your own feelings. You do not have to be defined by your circumstances that are ever-changing. The Lord offers renewal and new identity.
to anyone who will surrender and turn to him in faith. And don't be like Pharaoh. Don't harden your heart. Put your trust in the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this renewal. We thank you for the promise of hope, the promise of deliverance. Lord, I thank you even for the imagery that is given to us in Exodus of a God who stands watch over his people. Man, what a beautiful picture that you are not a God who stands far off. You are not a God who is stuck somewhere in the far reaches of space, distant, cold, unrelatable. You are a God who has come near. You are a God who has condescended to the lowly. You are a God who loves those who did not love you. Lord, you are a God who has to be trusted, who can be relied upon because you are near, because you watch, you guard, you protect, you keep us in your hand. And no one is stronger than you. No one can pluck us from your hand. Nothing can get through your hand except what comes from your hand. So God, regardless what you give to us this day or the next, may we see it as a blessing from a merciful God, even though we might not understand it as such, even though we might not be able to explain it, as such. Lord, for those who might be listening this morning, whether here or online, if they have not yet come to know the renewal and the forgiveness that is in Christ, God, would you grant that to them today? Grant them the faith to repent and to believe. We pray these things in Jesus' name.